be uh, turning shortly to Ma uh, Mark chapter 11 and verse 27. So, just hold it open and we'll be reading shortly. Mark chapter eleven twenty seven. in a few moments. I wonder what you make of Jesus. Who is Jesus? Perhaps you've come this morning, I don't know, dragged along or whatever, and you're, you're an unbeliever, or you're someone that uh, comes regularly, but at the moment you're just seeking. You wouldn't say that you knew Jesus, you wouldn't say that you know what this is to be born again, but you're, but you're interested, you want to know more. I wonder what you make of Jesus. Perhaps to you he's like some sort of hero character, uh, you know, like you might see uh, um, in, in the films, like Superman, uh, something fun for the kids, or, or uh, perhaps a mythological character. Uh, perhaps you see in him, yeah, a real man, uh, just, just a wise man who said some good things for us to take notice of. Or perhaps you would add to that, perhaps you, you, you would see him as a prophet, someone who spoke uh, from God or, or spoke about the future from God. Perhaps even you're more sceptical than that and you think that he might even be a deceiver, a liar, or deranged, delusional. Oh, and what about you, those of you that profess to be Christians? What about you? Is Jesus supreme in the world and in your life? Or, if you're honest with yourself, is it more like a, a good luck charm that you get out when you're in trouble? Is he just a good example for you to follow? Do, do you like to do things your way except for when you run out of knowing what to do and then you reach out for Jesus? And the passage that we're going to be um, reading uh, right now is a, a passage that speaks about this authority of, of Jesus. And the religious leaders come to Jesus and they effectively say, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Coming into the temple and messing things up like you did, who on earth do you think you are? Why do you think you can tell us what to do? Who gave you the right to speak and to do these things? So let's, let's read it. It's Mark chapter 11, verse 27 to 33. And they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him, and they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So, we're going to look at it like this. Firstly, there's two questions to think about, and then two answers. Just looking at the text, what are the two questions, what are the two answers? And then we're going to spend some time thinking about how this applies um, to us. So the two questions, verses 27 to 30. We find that it talks about the following day. We're now on Wednesday of the week leading up to Jesus' death on the Friday. So we're on Wednesday. They go back into Jerusalem and uh, Jesus is in the temple. And we're told that the chief priests, the scribes and the elders, these were the main groups in the uh, Sanhedrin. So these were, uh, this was like the leading uh, authority uh, amongst the Jews uh, in the nation and in their religion. And they come to Jesus to ask him this question. And then, of course, Jesus 
replies as he often does with a question back to them. So the first question that Jesus asks, by what authority are you doing these things or who gave you the authority to do them? Almost certainly speaking about what's just happened as Jesus has cleansed the, the temple the previous day. You can imagine the uproar. You can imagine that after the event of him cleansing the temple, the leaders getting together and say, what are we going to do about this man? And you might think, as they ask that question, by what authority are you doing these things, or who gave you the authority to do them, you might think, what a wonderful opportunity for Jesus to speak the truth. What a wonderful opportunity to proclaim who he was, to speak about his role as Messiah and what he was going to do and what they needed to do to respond. What a brilliant opportunity for him to explain the authority that he had from on high. But don't forget what had happened and what they'd said in chapter 11 and verse 18. It says the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. They feared him. These religious leaders saw Jesus as a threat. They weren't willing to listen to his words and they wanted to stop him speaking because they could see that people were following him. And so what they were trying to do was to get Jesus in trouble. They wanted him to say something that they could jump upon and would lead to a death sentence. They wanted to destroy him. They wanted to find a reason to justify him being killed. In other words, their question was a trap. Let's see if we can get Jesus to say something that we can probably, I'm thinking probably, call blasphemy. And then we can take him to be killed. They thought if they could only get Jesus to claim authority for himself or some direct authority from God, which of course he did have, but if they could only get him to say that, they could accuse him of blasphemy and bring the death sentence upon him. And so Jesus does not take it as an opportunity to, to preach. Rather, he responds with the question, which is in verses 29 and 30. He says to them, I will ask you one question, answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. So he asks them a question in return. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. Interesting uh, the way that he asked the question, isn't it? Twice he says, answer me. I he speaks with authority as he's speaking to them. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? They came to test Jesus and now he's turned the tables and he's testing them. They're the ones that are on trial, not him. Jesus is wanting to prick their conscience and make them think about the things that they're doing, the decisions they took about John and how they're responding to him. God had sent them a messenger. We're told he's the greatest of all prophets, John the Baptist. But they refused to listen to him. Two questions. Just as we pass by, interesting thought. Sometimes a wise question is a really good way to challenge someone who's trying to find every obstacle from avoiding the Christian faith, avoiding Jesus. Throw the question back. Perhaps that's something for us to think about as we speak to those who at the moment are resisting uh, the gospel message. Two answers then. Verses 31 to 33. Jesus completely stumped them. The chief priests, the scribes and the elders didn't know what to say. They, of course, couldn't uh, admit that they were wrong about John the Baptist and say that um, he came with a message from heaven because Jesus would say, well, why then didn't you listen and follow him? What a, what, a, what a thing to do, to admit that they were wrong. I, w I wonder if you ever struggle with that, admitting that you're wrong, or even being willing to contemplate the fact uh, that we might be wrong. It's very common, isn't it? Even 
amongst religious people and even in the church. They wouldn't admit that they were wrong. And they couldn't say what they really thought. They thought that Jesus, uh, that John, it wasn't true. They thought that it was a man-made message. And the reason why they couldn't say it is because they were scared of the people. It actually says, there's a little detail in Luke chapter 20 and verse 6 that I'd never noticed. It actually says that they were scared of the crowd. So this is Luke's version of the same account. Uh, Luke 20 verse 6, he says, they were scared of the, the crowd of stoning them. That, that's how, that's what, the, what reaction they thought they would get if they said that John, John's message was just a message of man. That's how scared they were of the people. And so they answer Jesus in verse 33, we don't know. And Jesus quickly follows up, neither then will I tell you by what authority I do these things. There we are. There's the little scenario. The point is this, the religious leaders were seeking to trap Jesus, wanting to encourage him to say things that would get him into trouble. And Jesus wisely avoids that and leaves the important question in their mind. The question that's left in their mind is by what authority is Jesus operating? What, what authority is Jesus doing these things in? And it, and it raises the same questions in our minds and in every other person that hears about Jesus. When we hear about him, we say, well, what authority has he got over our lives? Who gave him the right to say anything about the way that we should live? This is what you will get if you went around the streets and started telling people that Jesus says this and Jesus says the other. They'll say, well, who's Jesus? Why should I listen to him? He lived a few thousand years ago. If they believe he even existed, they might even think that he didn't exist. Who is he and what rights he got to do with me in Loftus in 2023? Well, you know, the answer to that question, who is Jesus? And what right has he got to speak to us and tell us what to do? You could say was the whole purpose of Mark's gospel. And that's what we're going to look at for the next uh, short while. Thinking about the authority of Jesus and how Mark has presented that through his gospel so far and how other parts of the scripture add to it and then think about what it means for us today. So let's take a look at the evidence. How did, how did Mark... Uh, recall all that happened in Jesus' life. Go back to the, the first verse that he wrote. This is the first verse of Mark's Gospel. He wants to make it plain right from the beginning that Jesus is a man with authority. He says, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He nails his colours to the mast. Right from the beginning, he says to us, Jesus is the Son of God. Look, look at verse 11 of chapter 1. Jesus has been baptized and a voice comes from heaven. You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased, says the Father from heaven. Look at verses 14 and 15, a summary of the ministry of Jesus. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time was fulfilled the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. John is, uh, uh, Mark is presenting uh, Jesus as the one with all authority, the authority of God, the Son of God, who is going to come as a king and bring the kingdom of God into being. And he's calling people to repent and to believe in the gospel. Notice the authority of Jesus in these early chapters of Mark. Look at chapter 1 and verses 21 and 22. It says, Immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught as one who had authority and not as one of the scribes. All the other teachers, what they would say is, well, so Rabbi so-and-so says this, and Rabbi so-and-so says the other, and they present their findings. Jesus spoke with authority from himself, and they could tell it was something completely different. He's taught with authority. In, in verse 24 of chapter 1, we see a demon identifying Jesus. Even the evil spirits knew who he was. They said, this is the Holy One of God. 
in verses 25 and 27, Je Jesus casts out this evil spirit. He proves that he has authority over demons. And when we see this many times through the, through the gospel. In verses 29 onwards of chapter 1, Jesus begins to heal. So we see that he has authority and power over sickness. Are you beginning to see the picture building up? This is, this is not someone to be ignored. This is someone with all authority. It's the Son of God. He can cast out demons. He can heal people's diseases. In chapter 2 and verse 5, he tells someone that their sins are forgiven. That, 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 that blew them away. I mean, they, they could sort of tolerate someone healing people, but someone standing and telling someone their sins were forgiven, only God could do that. And so Jesus proved that his sins were forgiven by then also healing that paralytic man. You remember that was the guy that was let down through the roof. Ch chapter 2 and verse 28, you find that Jesus now has, talks about having authority over the Sabbath. There's been this question about what they should or shouldn't do on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, verse 28, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Chapter 4, verse 39, we find Jesus calm in a storm. He has power and authority over the waves of the lake. Chapter 5 and verse 41, we meet this little girl, you remember? We meet Jairus first, but it's his daughter he's concerned about, and they get news that she's died, and Jesus still goes and says, oh no, she's just asleep. They knew fine well she was dead. They were already mourning her. And he went in and, and he said, little girl, I tell you, get up. What sort of man has authority over death to talk to a little girl? Well, first of all, to tell a parent, don't worry. She's going to be all right when you've just heard that your daughter's died. And then he goes and raises her to life. Chapter 7, he deals with some of the religious leaders who are coming and concerned about the way that the uh, disciples aren't cleansing themselves properly and, and ritual be, being defiled. And Jesus teaches them and speaks to them about where defilement really comes from. Not from the food that you put into your mouth, but from our hearts. He's correcting these uh, supposedly wise religious leaders. Chapter 8 and verse 29, Peter says that this is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Chapter 9, Jesus is transfigured before three of the disciples. They go up the mountain and they see Jesus transform into like a glow. They can barely look at him. They see something of the glory. It's like a, a veil had been over him and it's, it's like peeled back for a moment and they can't bear the brightness. They see something and again the Father's voice comes from on high. What does he say this time? Chapter 9 and verse 7. A cloud overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Now keep going back to what, what, what we're talking about. This, this incident in the temple where they're saying, who do you think you are? What right have you got? Who told you you could do this? And then we see some of these instances of Jesus being glorified and some of his power being displayed, the authority that he has over every realm. And think again how ridiculous it seems, these religious leaders asking him what right he's got to do and say the things that he does. In chapter 11, just a few weeks ago, we thought about Jesus coming into Jerusalem like a king and receiving praise from the people. I mean, you could say, and I think it'd be an accurate description of Mark, to say that, that Mark's gospel was written to convince you that Jesus came with the authority of God and in the authority of God. And, and of course, it's not just Mark's gospel. Let's just look at a few other uh, places in the Bible. One just from the Old Testament first, Isaiah chapter 9, this prophecy of, uh, of the, the birth of a son. Chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, I'm going to read from verse 6. Very familiar words from the Christmas season. Think about what it says about Jesus, though. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there shall be no end. 
on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. What greater authority could have been prophesied about the Lord Jesus? Think again of the words of the Great Commission at the end of Mark, uh, Matthew, sorry. The beginning of the Great Commission starts like this. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, uh, go, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you to, always to the end of the age. He says, all authority has been given to me, therefore, church, go and make disciples of all nations, and I'm going to be with you always to the very end. We're told in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, that he's going to be our judge. We're told in Philippians chapter 2, 9 to 11, that he's going to have the name that's above every name, and at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that he is Lord. We're told in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, that he is preeminent, that he is supreme above all things. We're told at the beginning of Hebrews, that, that over the years, many, many prophets have come and spoken in God's name, but now here comes the Son. He's the heir of all things, and he's the one that created the world. Think about Hebrews, if you know much about the book of Hebrews. Uh, an amazing book to read, when it shows us that the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies and shadows are in Christ. And it comes to a point in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25 and says that he is therefore able to save from the uttermost, or guttermost as some like to say. And then at the end of the Bible, we have the exalted King of Kings and Lord of Lords, uh, Revelation 19, 11 to 16. So, if this man who has this authority, the Son of God, comes to earth and comes to judge the temple, then surely they should listen to what he has to say, rather than questioning him about his right to say the th these things. What then are we, friends, to make of this little passage? As we reflect on the authority of Jesus over all things in heaven and on earth, that means all authority over the church, all authority over your life. What should we make of that as we think about it this morning, this authority of Jesus? There's a few things I think it means that we should not do. Do not take a stand against him. Do not take a stand against Jesus. You know, sometimes... Authority in other, in other places is misused, isn't it? There are times when we need to take a stand, even against those in authority over us. If you can't think of an example in life, think back in the Bible. Do you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? When King Nebuchadnezzar, he set up a golden, a golden uh, statue of himself, and he said, whenever you hear the music, I want you to bow down and worship me. And they were followers of the one true God the God of Israel, and they said they couldn't do it. So everyone else bowed down and they stood up. And Nebuchadnezzar said, that fire is going to be heated up seven times hotter than it normally is. If you will not bow down, you'll go into the fire. And they stood against his authority and said, no, we have a higher authority. We are not bowing down. And they said, God's able to save us from the fire, and even if he doesn't, we're still not bowing down. There are times when we need to stand against wrongful authority. Jesus, though, his authority is perfect. He never makes a mistake. He never says something that's wrong. He never calls us to do something that's against God's purposes and will. In fact, all that he ever does is for our good. So don't ignore him. Don't take a stand against him. Perhaps in your heart at the moment, I, I say this to you children as well, uh, adults and children alike, 
It's easy to come through the motions, to go to church, but in your hearts, still be standing against God and saying, no, I won't. No, I won't follow him as my king. No, he's not Lord of that part of my life. Don't take a stand against Jesus. Secondly, don't bring fake questions to try and avoid the challenge that Jesus brings. I know some people have genuine questions. And you know, if you're someone that's seeking and wanting to know the truth, there's time to ask questions and to hear answers. It's not that you know, we're reluctant to want to give answers and to talk things through. But there are some people who just bring, we call them red herrings, don't we? They're not really interested in the answer. They just want to get into an argument with you about something rather than be confronted with the authority of Jesus. So perhaps they want to talk about evolution um, until the end of that. And now there's, there's some questions about that. Let's talk about it. But ask yourself, am I just asking this to just avoid the confrontation? Because at the end of the day, what it means to be a Christian is to be confronted with the reality of the authority of Jesus. And the question is, are you going to bow to him? Are you going to follow him? So don't bring false questions like these guys did just to avoid the confrontation that was going on in their hearts. The question is, who is Jesus and will you follow him? So here's some things to do. Respond to his invitation. Here right at the beginning, as he sets out on his ministry, chapter 1, verse 15, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Weigh up the evidence. Be willing to humbly admit that you are wrong. This is the call to everybody to become a Christian, is to realise that we've been wrong, trying to do stuff for ourselves, trying to do it our own way, rather than God's way. Trying to think that we can be our own saviour when actually we need a saviour that's greater than us. Secondly, worship him and follow him in obedience. Here, Christians, listen. Worship him. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. Worship him, follow him, obey him. You, you know, some of us have problems with authority. Perhaps you've had someone in authority over you who has not used it very well, and it makes you very suspicious. Or perhaps you've had, a, I don't know, an incident, an incident where you've been treated badly by someone else in authority at school or um, in civil life. And, and therefore you find authority hard. But authority is not, um, it's for our good. God set up these structures for our good and, and, and Jesus has this authority that we might come to him and, and know what's best for us. This isn't about um, us being like squashed into God's will. <clears throat> this is about God saying to you, this is what's best for you. Listen to my son and follow him. It will be a delight to your soul. It will bring hope for you. It, it will bring good things into your life. It might feel like you're bringing restrictions into your life or, 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 or trapping yourself, but actually it will be the cause of you being set free. Worship him, follow him, obey him. In your struggles, be encouraged and comforted that Christ has all authority in heaven and on earth. Now, I don't know the answers to all your struggles and trials. The Bible gives us some help, but it doesn't give all, all the answers. But we can trust that even when life is difficult, even when hard times come, Jesus still has all authority in heaven and on earth. It's not because he has got caught out that you are struggling or you're suffering in some way. He is perfectly still in charge, just like he was the day before. Don't doubt his authority over all things. It's so tempting when things are difficult to doubt that he really is in control. But the Bible tells us, and it's never lied yet, I've never found anything false in the Bible, he is in control today, just like he was yesterday. And lastly, thinking of this authority, tell other people about it. Living life under the rule of King Jesus is a delight. It's a joy. It's true freedom. It's what we were made for. 
tell others about this king. Tell others to humble themselves before this king. Speak to them about what it's like for you to know him as your king and lord. And that how humbling yourself before him has actually brought you real freedom and joy. It brought a peace that you'd never known before. So point others to him. So here's, here's the great and urgent need. As we, think about, as we think about authority, here's the great and urgent need. Humble yourself before the authority of Jesus. Submit to him. Yield to him. Find your security and encouragement in him and proclaim him to others. Who gave Jesus the right to challenge us? Who gave Jesus the, the right to speak to the leaders like this, to, to bring judgment to the temple? At times to correct the uh, uh, religious leaders. Who, who, who gave him that authority? He has it himself because he is the author of life. He is the sustainer of life. He is the redeemer. And again, hear his words as words of love. Not a harsh, overbearing master, but a master that has laid his life down for you. If you're in doubt about that, think about the cross and what was going on at the cross. The author of life laid down his life for you. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you grant us some greater understanding this morning, some recognition in our hearts that Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. And yes, he can say what he likes to those in the temple and he can do what he likes because he has authority. And so too in my life, he can command, he can send, he can rebuke. Help me to accept him as the one with that authority over every part of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.